right, today the Torah portion, as you can see, is re'eh, and it means to behold. Not just look, not just see, but behold something. Get the whole ramifications of what you are seeing. And so what we have here, God is instructing the Israelites that upon entering the promised land, they have to stop between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And what is right in the middle is the town of Shechem or Shechem, which is located between these two mountains. Now look at Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 29. The Torah portion begins with Re or behold. I'm going to set before you this day a blessing and a curse. What do you choose? blessing you would thank and he says the blessing only comes if you listen which means hear and obey the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you this day and I present to you the curse if you don't listen to the commandments of the Lord your God but you turn aside out of the way I command you this day to go after other gods which you've never known it'll happen when the Lord your God will bring you into the land that you go to possess you will set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. It is your choice. Now, let's look at, uh, let me come over here. Here, oh, I have it here. Okay. It, you remember the matrix? Do you want the blue pill or the red pill? And uh, God is saying, you can have a treasure chest of blessings or you can be killed. It's your choice. Uh, what's so interesting is so often we want one, but we choose the other. But I, I have the picture of like uh, the Mediterranean Sea. There's Tel Aviv. Okay, right here is Mount Gerizim. There is Mount Ebal. And so Mount Ebal faces Jerusalem, the mountain of the cursing. And here is Shechem. It's right in here where they were. And so the curses went here and the blessings came from there. Now, here's a picture of the actual place. Okay, so Jerusalem is to the south. Lebanon is to the north. The blessings, the cursing. And right in the middle, this town here, right in here is, you know, where everything was happening. And they were on the two slopes. And I don't know, but Joshua's altar that they built is still there. Isn't that amazing? And I think next October, we're going to go to Joshua's altar. Now, so here is Mount Ebal, city of Shechem, Mount Gerizim. Over there is Elon Moray, which is the place that Abraham built the very first altar. And God said, look. Around. This is the area that he was seeing when God said, everywhere you see, this is yours. What do we find here? After they crossed in Joshua 8, verse 30, it says, Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. This is where they renewed the covenant uh, after 40 years of wandering. Uh, back to Deuteronomy 11, 30, though, Moses, who had never been there, uh, says, aren't they beyond the Jordan, behind the way of the going down of the sun in the land of the Canaanites, who dwelt in the Aravah against Gilgal, besides the oaks of Moray? What happened about 500 years before Moses said that? Look at Genesis 12, 5 through 7. Abram takes Sarah, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, all their substance they had gathered, and even the souls whom they have gotten in Haran. And they went to go to the land of Canaan. Into the land of Canaan they came. And then Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, Shechem, to the oak of Moray. The Canaanite was in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your seed. He built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. We're going there. <laughs> We're going to be going to Elon Moray. We're going to be going to Joshua's altar. I mean, this is phenomenal. Okay, then look what it says in our Torah portion in Deuteronomy 12, 2 and 3. He says, when you get there, you have to utterly destroy 
all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess serve their gods, on the high mountains, on the hills, under every green tree, and you have to overthrow their altars, break their pillars, burn their groves, and hew down the graven images of their gods, and destroy the names of them out of that place. So they were to go into the land and just start cleaning up. Kind of like if you go to get a house and it has a lot of work that's got to be done when you go to buy it, restoration stuff, the first thing you do is start cleaning it out. That's what God wanted Israel to do. But we know what did Solomon do? He built the altars. For every one of his thousand pagan wives, he built an altar instead of tearing down the altars. Now, if you look at Deuteronomy 12, 5, it says, but under the place which the Lord your God will choose, which is where? Jerusalem. To all, out of all your tribes to put his name there, even into his habitation, that's where you to go, and that's where you shall come. Now, you know what's interesting, what that tells us? God makes choices too. And God said, the, that's why actually one of his names is Makom, which means the place. That's where we go, to the place where he is. Now, I always thought this was amazing because this is what's happening today. In Deuteronomy 12, 8, do not do after all the things that is happening here. Every man, whatever is right in his own eyes. How many of you heard, you know, uh, it was the Stoics 2,300 years ago that says your truth is different from my truth. There is no universal truth, all right? Deuteronomy 13, 18. Look at this. When you shall listen to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all of his commandments, which I command you this day to do that which is right in the eyes of of the Lord your God. Are we supposed to do what's right in our own eyes as we try to justify it? Are we supposed to do what's right in God's eyes? As a matter of fact, look what happens a couple hundred years later in the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel yet. It was the time of the judges. And everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. Knowing no one was really doing what was right in God's eyes. Now, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. When you go over the Jordan and you live in the land that the Lord your God is selling you, no, giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies so that you live in safety, then to the place, Hamakom, that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offering, sacrifices, tithes, contributions, all your first finest vows, offerings that you will vow to the Lord. <clears throat> you know why he said that? I, I, there's a couple of interesting things that I see here. One of them, no tribe can be jealous then. I mean, first off, everyone says, well, God is everywhere, so why can't I worship him here. Well, God is everywhere, but he has a place in particular that you're to go to. Now, every tribe would be vying for, let the altar in the temple be picked in my tribal area. But they can't complain when God is the one who chose. Whose tribe was it in? Which tribe was the temple in the geographical territory of things? Which tribe had the temple built in it? Benjamin and Judah. Judah had the Temple Mount area, but right where the Holy of Holies is, that belonged to Benjamin. Kind of fascinating. Okay. <clears throat> and then in Deuteronomy 12, 5, in all the places where I record my name, I will come to you and I will what? All the places I record my name, I will come to you. Where has he recorded his name? 
the priestly blessing and I will place my name upon them, on you. Yeah. God says, I not only will bless you, I will put my name on you. I'm going to record my, do you realize his, most people don't realize their, his name is recorded on you. And that's why in the priestly blessing, and I will bless you. Okay. Wow. I mean, I think this is just huge. That's where he will come to and bless you. That means if you have his name recorded on you and you know it, you can say, Lord, come and bless this place. I think that's amazing. The word the place appears 16 times. You know, and I think it was interesting that even with Adam, God said, you have a choice. You can eat of both trees, but one of them will bring you life and one will kill you. And yet he chose the one that killed him. Did they not believe? Did he not believe that that would happen? I think he did, which is why he had his wife go first. <laughs> yeah, who knows? But that was horrible. He didn't protect her. He's supposed to protect her. Immediately after fashioning Adam from the dust of the earth, God challenged him with one choice. Observe my commandment, don't eat from the tree of knowledge and live, or transgress my one commandment and receive the curse and die. And Adam's first choice was to die. And what most people don't realize, the Garden of Eden was in Israel. It wasn't over there in Iraq like people think. It, the Garden of Eden was Jerusalem. It was right there. And I think that's... Oh, I mean, why would someone, why, why every time we sin, we chose death? So we can't, you know, say, I wouldn't have done, I used to always say, oh, I wouldn't have done that when, if I was Adam back then. I'd have cut that tree down. But then I had to realize it's not my tree to cut down. That's, <laughs> and it's like, uh-oh. So look at Genesis 22, 2 and 3. And he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. You know, it's interesting. They say there was a discussion going on here. God tells Abraham, take your son. And he goes, well, I have two sons. And he goes, your only son, Isaac. Oh, wow. And then he's still questioning. I love them both. <laughs> you know, kind of. He goes, the one whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah. And I don't know if you knew this, but in Islam, they teach it wasn't Isaac. It was Ishmael. I don't know if you knew that. Okay, offer him up for a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you of. So Abraham, I, you know, if, if someone told me they were going to offer my son up, I don't know if I'd get up early in the morning. <laughs> I'd have slept in that day. But he says Abraham rose up early saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him. And uh, they also say that that was Ishmael, was one he did take with him, and Eliezer, his servant. And it says, and Isaac, his son, and he claved the wood for the burnt offering, rose up and went to where? The place. And where is the place? Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. And so in Genesis 22, for on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw what? The place, Ha-Makom. This is one of God's names, Ha-Makom. And then look what it says in Genesis 22, 14. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh or Jehovah Yireh. And what does that mean? Yireh means what? What's the Torah portion today? Re'e which means behold. And so it says, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. This is our Torah portion, to behold, to see. This is not only a place, this is the place where both man and God have to make a choice. And the choice is, we'll each create a shared space where both man and God can come together, which is why the temple was created there. It is a place for the heart, the soul. It's a place where man sees God and God sees man. It's a place where man is commanded also to rejoice and to celebrate like on the festival of Sukkot. And God also is waiting 
He has made his choice. He knows the location of the place. Are we going to rise up in the morning like Abraham early to meet God in that place? Are we going to choose the blessing? What's so cool is we're going this December to the place. Not only are we going to go on the Temple Mount, we're going to go under the Temple Mount in the Western Wall tunnels, which would be so fun. Now look at Deuteronomy 12, 28 through 32. Observe and hear all of these words which I command you, that it can go well with you and with your children after you forever when you do that which is, here it is, good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. It says, when the Lord your God cuts off these nations from before you that you go in to possess their territory and you succeed them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you're not snared by following them after they've been destroyed from before you and that you inquire not after their gods. Well, how do these nations serve their gods? The reason that is said is back then they believed every nation had their own God. And if they wanted to do well, they had to serve the God of that nation. And they did a lot of traveling. Uh, so anyway, they were, God was afraid since they left Egypt. They're now in the promised land. They asked the Canaanites how they serve their gods so that they will be blessed. And God says, no, don't do that. And he says, you shall not do so to the Lord your God for every abomination to the Lord that he hates have they done to their gods which tells you that they don't even really worship their own gods. For even their sons and their daughters, they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What things have I command you observe to do it? Don't add to it. Don't diminish from it. And this is, Molech was one of the ancient gods that the Ammonites and the Moabites served. Israel never heard of that god. And what happens? Solomon marries an Ammonite and a Moabite, and he's the first one to sacrifice his children to their God. The other thing that's important, God determines what is holy to him. Man can determine what is holy to them, but man cannot determine what is holy to God. That's a really a deep, heavy concept God determines what is holy to him. In the rest of the Torah portion, God is the one who outlines the times, the places, the things, the actions, the foods that are holy to him by which his people can also enter into holiness with him. There are holy times, holy places, holy food, holy income through tithing, a holy tongue. God's people are to destroy any pagan, corrupting, defiling influences by putting these things out of the land of Israel. Man cannot determine what day is holy to God. We can determine what day. In Islam, it's Friday. Okay? Uh, but, I mean, in some places, what makes you holy to God is if you only wear dresses or if you uh, wear a kerchief over your head. That's man determining what is holy, or wear no makeup, or wear lots of makeup. I don't know. But the, the whole thing is, these churches that define holiness based on what man decides is holy, and totally forgetting the biblical calendar that God decides is holy. There's even holy cows. <laughs> now, look at this. Deuteronomy 13 is one of the most amazing chapters. How many believe there are prophets today? Well, I know every Pentecostal believes there's prophets. I'm not against Pentecostals. I'm not against prophets. But you have to test the prophets. Look at this. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass. How do you know if a prophet's a true prophet or not? If the sign or wonder comes to pass. But that's not the whole truth. That's just part of the truth. That's the stint. This is why I don't believe in 99% of the Christian prophets today. 
is because of what's next. It says, whereof he spoke saying, hey, let's go after other gods which you've not known and let's serve him. You shall not hearken to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to see whether you really love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Okay, it says this. It says, you shall walk after the Lord your God, fear him, keep his commandments and obey his voice and serve him and cleave to him. And the prophet or that dreamer of dreams will be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. All right, now I want you to think of this. What this is saying is as a prophet comes and says, you know, whatever they say, but it goes against Torah, they're a false prophet. But now think about this. If Christians say Yeshua was a prophet, Yeshua did miracles. Everything he said said come to pass. But when the Christian tells the Jew, and guess what? He did away with the Torah. It's over. And Christians don't know how to evangelize to the Jews. They, they're, they're, everything is so wrong. How can you, and Yeshua said to the Jew first, the reason why the Jew hasn't been first, but they, you know, really have been hit hard, is that Christians can't understand because they say the Torah is done away with, and they don't know Deuteronomy. How can anyone, how can any Jew believe Yeshua is the Messiah if he did away with the Torah? Wow. So, let's see. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, we went through that. Let's jump to Acts 2, verse 22. This is after he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and the disciples say, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by what? Miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. That's all great. But if, if he didn't follow Torah, we just read there to kill him. And the Jews say it's a good thing we did kill him because you Christians said he was trying to do away with the Torah. They were doing God a favor according to the Torah. But look at Matthew 24, 24. There's going to rise many false messiahs, false prophets, and they're also going to show great signs and wonders. In so much, if it were possible, they will deceive the very elect. We're not to follow signs and wonders. The signs and wonders are to follow you. But too many people, I hear it all the time. People, want, what did you hear about that prophet? What this prophet said or that prophet said? And I go, do they follow Torah? No. Chuck it. I don't care. I don't care. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 and 9. Then will that wicked one be revealed. And do you know what the wicked, the Greek word for wicked is here? Anomos. It means without Torah. The lawless one. Law is Torah. Whenever you hear the lawless one, that means Torah-less. And the great wicked one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth. He'll destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. These times are coming very soon when you're going to see all kinds of crazy stuff. You cannot go after miracles, signs, wonders. That's the devil's specialty. The key is, does he go against Torah? It's really simple. But if you don't know Torah, how would you know? So here, I've got these miracles. Okay. But if God's law is broken, don't listen to that prophet. Okay, now let's look at Deuteronomy 14, 7 and 8, which is part of our Torah portion. It says, nevertheless, these are the things I don't want you to eat of them. Those that chew the cud, divide the cloven hoof as the camel, and 
the hair. And the coney, they chew the cud, but divide not the hoof, therefore they're unclean to you. And the swine, because it divides the hoof and chews not the cud, it is unclean to you. You should not eat of their flesh nor touch their dead carcasses. All right, let's look on in verse 11 through 21. Of all the clean birds you shall eat, and these are they which you shall not eat. It mentions all, you know the amazing thing, the difference between the clean and unclean food you can tell real quick? Are they predators or not? Everything that is unclean is a predator. Everything that is clean is not a predator. There's a whole other way that people need to be looking at things. And if you go back to Genesis, the very first sin was based on what you put in your mouth. Now, <clears throat> here's what's fascinating, though. Look at the bold. But of all clean fowls you may eat... You shall not eat anything that dies of itself. That means even a kosher animal. If there is a kosher lamb that is old and, or maybe it has a disease and it dies of itself, they are not to eat anything that dies on its own, even if it is considered clean. But look at this. It says, just give it to the stranger. <laughs> Okay, that's within your gates. And he may eat it, or he may even sell it to an alien. For you are a holy people of the Lord your God. You shall not see the kid in his mother's milk, which does not mean you can't eat a cheeseburger, but that's where it's jumped to. Okay, but here's the thing. There's, people say, well, there's nothing wrong with eating this or that. You're right, because God said, let everybody else eat it. It's just not good for you if you want to be in relationship with God. So it's all about holiness. It's not about a salvation. It is not a salvation issue. It's a holiness issue. Now, clean food, let's say a lamb, which is clean, if it can't be eaten, then it's called impure or pig ul. Pig ul. That's in Hebrew, pig ul. There's different levels of purity. Uh, look at Leviticus 22.8. He's not to eat what dies of itself. Or if uh, you have something that's kosher, but it's been torn by a lion or something, uh, and so make himself unclean by it, I am the Lord. Deuteronomy 15.1 and 2, what do we find? It says, at the end of every seven years, you're to make a release. What is that talking about? What time period? A Shemitah cycle. And here's the Shemitah year. And it's about economic reset. This is where we got our bankruptcy laws from. You can only claim bankruptcy every seven years. Came from this. Every creditor that lends <clears throat> ought to his neighbor shall release it. He's not to exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it's called the Lord release. And then in Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 9, it says, If there be among you a poor man or one of your brothers within your gates in the land the Lord gives you, don't harden your heart or shut your hand to your poor brother. But you will open your hand wide and lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wants. And beware that there's not a thought of your wicked heart saying, Oh, it's the Shemitah year and your eye be evil against your poor brother. And you give him nothing and he cry to the Lord against you and it be a sin to you. Well, what's interesting, what does it mean for your eye to be evil? An evil eye, like if we look at Matthew 6, 22 through 24, says the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, your eye should be single. Your whole body's full of light. But if your eye be evil, so what does it mean to have an evil eye? It means to be stingy. That's what we just read, someone who wouldn't lend. So an evil eye basically means someone who is greedy, which is why it ends with you cannot serve God and mammon. Look at Proverbs 28, 22. Whoever hastens to be rich has a evil eye. Proverbs 22, 9. He who has a bountiful eye will be blessed. He who gives of his bread to the poor. So that's what an evil eye and a good eye refer to is stinginess or blessing. And so we have Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 3. It says, observe the month of Aviv, which is spring, and keep the Passover unto the Lord your God in the month of Aviv. And the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt. Why? In the month of Aviv. Vive. And then in verse 15 and 16, it says we're to keep the feast for seven days in the place. There it is again. 
And it says, and the Lord your God in the place named by him. That's where all the men have to come three times a year. Now, why doesn't it say the women? Why does it say only the men had to come three times a year? Because the men had to be told what to do. The women want to come three times a year. They love the fellowship. Woohoo! we're going. So that's why he didn't require the women. He only required the men. But it's for the women, it's natural. Party, get to meet everybody. Okay, and the men, they're going to be too busy with their farm. I don't have time. And who's going to protect the farm? Okay, so the men had to be commanded to go. And God said he would overlook all of their property and make sure none of the nations would invade their land. He would protect them. Man, if Israel would only be holy today, God would do that for them. Amen. Let's stand. Avinu Mokeno, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we could have so much fun looking into your word, what you told us 3,500 years ago, and it's still alive today. Father, I thank you for all those that are here locally, as well as all of those who are all around the United States and all around the world. We just want to thank you so much that they also want to magnify the Torah, make it honorable, and so into this ministry, Father, that wants to just magnify you and not ourselves. It's your kingdom, not our kingdom. Thank you for those who are helping us to take the light of the Torah to the nations. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Are you ready? We're going back to the Song of Songs, which is really about a return to God as our king. Okay, so here we are. Let's open the curtains. We are still in Act 1, which is chapter 1, verse 2 through chapter 2, verse 7. We're going to finish this act today. We're going to find she's double-minded, trying to choose between a human king, Solomon, or does she want the Lord, who is her shepherd, as her king? And I think it's fascinating in First Peter chapter 5, verse 2 through 4, it says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serve as overseers, not by force, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as lording over the flock, but be examples to the flock. So when the chief shepherd appears, who's the chief shepherd? Yeshua, the Messiah. And then it says, you'll receive the crown of glory that doesn't fade away. Now, I just want to bring up Isaiah 5. Many of you may already know that, but it's, uh, it's about how God planted a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he planted it and took the stones out and took all great care of it. And then it says, but the vineyard brought forth wild grapes. Okay, and so he says, what? am I to do with my vineyard? Well, we know Israel's the vineyard. And this song is all about working the harvest, working the vineyard with Messiah. Now, if you remember last week, she compared herself. She did all the talking, all right? And she compared herself to the blackness of the tents of Kedar. What does that refer to? I went over it a little bit, talking about how it was moral darkness, but... Does anyone know who Kedar was? So let's look at who Kedar was. <clears throat> look at this. In Genesis 25, verse 13, these were the names of the sons of Ishmael. By their names, according to their generation, the firstborn was Ishmael, Nebahoth, and then Kedar. So we know Kedar was a son of Ishmael. Now, In the Psalms, what does the psalmist have to say about the morality of Kedar? Remember I told you the blackness refers to their morals? Psalm 120, verse 1 through 7. 
in my distress, I cried to the Lord and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, a deceitful tongue. What will be given to you or what shall be done to you, you false tongue, sharp arrows of the warrior with coals of the broom tree. Woe is me that I dwell in Meshach, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Kedar is people who have lying lips. Hmm, how does that sound like some of these Hamas truces? I think they've made seven truces with Gaza. Okay, and someone who hates peace. So we see Kedar, the tense of Kedar is people who are full of lying lips, deceitful tongues, and hate peace. So now I want you to understand what she is talking about. She is equating herself to the same character traits of the son of Ishmael. She has lying lips and a deceitful tongue. Okay, <clears throat> but guess what? There is hope for her, and there's even hope for Kadar. Look at Isaiah chapter 60, verse 5 through 7. Then you will see and flow together, and your heart will fear and be enlarged. Look at this. Because the abundance of the sea will be converted to you. Do you realize the sea speaks to the nations? And he's saying the abundance, of, the abundance of the nations are going to go to the belief of the Jewish people. And then it says the forces of the Gentiles are going to come to you. The multitude of camels will cover you. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba will come. They shall bring gold and incense and they will show forth the praises of the Lord. All these other nations are going to come to Jerusalem showing the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together unto you. Isn't this amazing? <clears throat> okay, well now let's take a minute. And I want to show you Ezekiel chapter 16. Some of you may wonder, what does all this have to do with the Song of Songs? I'm showing you. Now watch this. As I live, says the Lord God, he's speaking to Jerusalem. And he says, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Now, do you remember who are the daughters? The daughters of the surrounding communities. Okay, you have Jerusalem. One of her sisters to the north is Samaria. And one of her sisters to the south is Sodom. And all their daughters are the surrounding communities that were born out from them. And look at what he's saying. He says that Jerusalem's sin was worse than the sins of Sodom. <clears throat> he says, look. I mean, all of us, we think we have some idea of what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was. Not. That wasn't the sin. That was like the flower. It wasn't the root. It says right here. Here was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had, what's number one? Pride. Fullness of food. Abundance of idleness. Fat and lazy. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor or needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. You know, what the thing is, they say uh, when it happened many years ago, back then, they did not like newcomers. And if any newcomer would come, they'd run them out of town. All right. And they never wanted to help the poor. They never wanted to help the needy. <clears throat> and then it says, Samaria, your other sister to the north. She didn't even commit half of your sins, but you have multiplied your abominations more than they. And then he says this, you have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you have done. So Jerusalem has done more abominations than Sodom or Samaria, which is why in the book of Revelation, it talks about Jerusalem uh, being as Sodom. But what's worse, you know what's worse about it? He says, you judge your sisters. Here you're condemning Sodom, you're condemning Samaria, and you're doing worse than they are. 
It says, because the sins which you committed were ab more abominable than theirs. They're more righteous than you. Yes, be disgraced also and bear your own shame because you justified your sisters. Wow, we all get on Sodom's case. We all get on Samaria's case. But this is the problem again about pointing the fingers and judging one another. Almost every time, even some of these preachers that are judging these other preachers are doing the very same thing. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem were haughty and self-righteous. That speaks a lot about the church. The church is always condemning the world, but there's bigger problems in the church a lot of times than there is in the world. But this is what happens in the case of all those who are self-deceived. The bad thing about being self-deceived is you don't know you're deceived. So let's look at what happens in Ezekiel 16, Chapter, uh, verse 60 through 63. God says, nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you as in the days of your youth. I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you're going to remember your ways and be ashamed. Look at this. When is that going to happen? When you receive your older and your younger sisters. I am going to give you to them for daughters but not because of my covenant with you. I'm going to establish my covenant with you, and then you'll know that I am the Lord, and then you will remember and be ashamed and never open up your mouth anymore because of your own shame. When I provide you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. There's a, you know, among the Orthodox Jews, they're, you know, they like to present themselves as all-knowing and very righteous, and, you know, that's all great. But what happens when all, I think God is going to really bring Israel to a low point for revival's sake. And then what's going to happen, all of a sudden, they won't think of themselves higher and mightier than the lowly Gentile. Everyone is going to shut their mouth. You look at all the denominations in Christianity, all casting stones at one another. You know, you look at the Jews and Christians casting stones at one another. God's going to bring us all to the point where we all just shut up. <laughs> he really is. Okay. The other thing I want to bring out that you're going to see in this book, the Song of Songs, you have Jerusalem and you have the daughters of Jerusalem. Solomon doesn't love Jerusalem. Solomon loves the daughters of Jerusalem. Okay, let's watch this. Now, here is the shepherd. Last Shabbat, it was all about her talking. Finally, the shepherd gets a word in. But let me remind everybody, I forgot to announce this. We are meeting next week. It's not going to be a live stream only because I'm not in Israel. So we are going to be here next Shabbat. So all of you can watch live stream and I'll be here. Okay. Here goes the shepherd. He says to her, I have compared you, oh, my love. So when, it, when he says, oh, my love, we know it's him. What does she always say? What does she always call him? My beloved. She always says, my beloved. He always says, my love. That's how you know who's talking. And look at this right there. He says, I compare you to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, your neck with... Chains of gold. Now, what in the world is he talking about? You know, when you think of a horse, horses are beautiful. How many ever had horses? Horses, uh, they're amazing animals. As a matter of fact, why is he comparing her to a company of horses? How many ever heard of the Kyle woman in Proverbs 31? Listen to the book of Job. <clears throat> Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. He paws in the valley. He rejoices in his strength. He gallops into the clash of arms. He mocks at fear. He is not frightened, nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him. The glittering spear and javelin 
he devours the distance with fierceness and rage, nor does he come to a halt because the trumpet is sounded. At the blast of the shofar, he says, aha, he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of captains and shouting. So the bridegroom sees the bride as a powerful force, unafraid of danger. Now we will hear again from the Shulamite. And she mentions that the king is sitting at his table in one room while she is in her room thinking of her beloved being with her. But before I do that, and the shepherd said, I compare you to a company of horses. And then he says, your neck with chains of gold. Take a look at this. Here's chains of gold around her neck. And we know, look at Proverbs 1, verse 9. My son, hear the instruction of your father. Don't forsake the Torah of your mother. They shall be an ornament of grace unto your head and chains about your neck. When he says her neck is graced with chains, it refers to the Torah. That's what he's saying. Are you following me? Can you see right in Proverbs, the Torah is a chain around her neck. And here in Song of Songs, he says your neck has chains of gold. That's what she's graced with, the Torah. But the problem, many of the church think, the Torah is those kinds of chain around their neck. Okay? It's like, get this thing off of me. The Torah is some horrible chain. No. It's a graceful, beautiful necklace is how the Torah is supposed to look like. Okay. So now we come to the daughters of Jerusalem. Okay? So I got a picture of the daughters of Jerusalem. And they're the ones talking now. First, if you remember... They were mocking the Shulamite bride when she says, where can I find you at lunchtime? Where do you feed your flocks at noon? Remember? But what happens, the shepherd comes in between the two of them and he praises the bride. So now the daughters of Jerusalem kind of go, oh, okay, we better be nice. And so they say, oh, and we'll make borders of gold with studs of silver. Okay, so now they're being nice. Now, before I go into this next part, I want to talk about something. This will, this will really help you. How many of you know smells bring back memories? Big time. Big time. For example, I was talking to a military man who was, during the war, he was serving in Kuwait. And he would go to the cafeteria, and he said there was a smell that would always comfort him and bring him back home, and it was at breakfast when they had Fruit Loops. Every time he would smell Fruit Loops, it would bring him memories of home. And now that he's home, every time he smells Fruit Loops, he thinks of being in Kuwait. You know how the, the smell works with the memory. How many of you remember the smell of freshly cooked bread coming out of the oven? Do you recognize that smell? How about the smell of a new baby coming fresh out of the oven? <clears throat> well, how about the poor father remember the smell of the stinky diaper they have to change? He'll never forget that smell. Oh, and you can smell fresh wine and cheese can bring back memories or chocolate. Okay, but smells can take you back decades and remind you of something. This is why God had all the spices in the temple, in the anointing oil, in the incense, so that we would remember home. The temple is to be home and Think about that. All of the spices were to bring back the smells of home. That, I mean, why else would God do that? He knows our smell is looking at something can bring back a memory, but smelling it can bring back more. Memory. I mean, looking at a box of Fruit Loops may bring back memories, but you smelling the Fruit Loops, it's really going to bring back the memory. So God 
had the whole entire temple system set up for us to remember the memory of fellowship with him. Okay. For example, every Havdalah, what do you do? At Havdalah, you light the candle, you have some wine, and then you have incense, and everyone smells it. Every Saturday night at the end, they pass this thing around and to smell. And again, it's to bring back memories. Now, look at Exodus 30, 7 through 9. It says, Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamps and will burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamp, said, even he will burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generation. You shall not offer what? No strange incense. Remember Nadab and Abihu. <laughs> they offered strange fire with strange incense. Okay. But it's to be every morning and every night, God wanted this incense burning. And then he says, look at Exodus 30, 23 through 25. The Lord tells Moses, I want you to take the best of the spices, 500 shekels weight of liquid myrrh. Here's some myrrh with some liquid myrrh here. And he said, I want a whole bunch of it, 500 shekels weight. And let's throw in some sweet cinnamon. Okay, and, and he says, you know, half as much as that, 150 shekels, and then 250 shekels of sweet calamus and of cassia, 500 shekels, weight measured by the scale of the holy place, and of olive oil, a hen. Make these into a holy oil, a perfume made by the art of the perfume maker. It is to be holy oil. Okay, so I want you to understand uh, how the spices the whole concept, even in the temple or the tabernacle, was to bring the smell of sweet incense. Now, look at Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Oh, before I go there, I want to show you some more things. I've got to tell you this. Okay, here is the temple, and I don't know if you knew it, but like a farm, they have a little farmhouse in the temple itself. There was a place where they would have the cattle pen and the sheep pens, and they would, you know, always have to check them to make sure they were without blemish one more time when they went to have them be offered. Now, you have to think about this. It's a slaughterhouse, okay? When you're slaughtering meat, what do you have? Flies. I'm telling you, do you have flies? And they don't have refrigeration and they're hanging out in the sun in front of the temple. OK, so if you'll notice in this picture over here is the altar. There's the big laver. And here's where they would slaughter all the animals. They'd be chained up here and hung up and like you would hang up a chicken or whatever else. And they would slaughter them right there. Uh, in the holy place or in the outer courtyard. And then they would take, they'd have blood be going everywhere, which is why they had the laver. Got to wash our hands. But all the animals would be hanging there. Can you imagine, it is outside how many flies are going to be all around it? But God knows what he's doing. The formula of the incense kept all the flies away. They say not one time was there ever a fly. Not one time. It's because the incense not only would bring memories of the past, but the formula kept all insects away. I mean, that's insane. It's outside. It's in a desert. It's hot. You've got raw meat hanging there. Not one fly because of the spices. Only God. <laughs> well, here, I'll tell you what. Well, they said the holy oil, no one could make it or they're dead. This has, now, you could get your own special, different formula a little bit. But here, how many of you know, sometimes people will put a sachet of different incense and they'd put it in their dresser drawers or in a chest. Uh, I remember my mom, we had a cedar chest and she'd always put something inside of it. To, I forgot what it was. <clears throat> yeah, mothballs and different things. Ooh, that smell. <clears throat> but sometimes back in the day, what ladies would do, 
they would get a sachet of incense with a string and they would wear it around their neck. And so the sachet bag, everywhere they went, they would smell good. They would wear it around their neck. All right. Okay. Now I'm laying the foundation here. So look at, let me see. Okay. So back to the Song of Songs 1, 12 through 14. And I think this is fascinating. She says, while the king was on his couch. Okay, here's Solomon. He's over on his couch. <laughs> Woo-hoo! And she says, while the king was over on his couch, my beloved, and she's not referring to the king because he's over on his couch. And she says, my beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved to me is as a cluster of, of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. And so what do we see here? There's a, a spike nard or a, the nard. And what does she say? It's like myrrh and henna in the vineyards of Engedi. And she is remembering all of a sudden she's in the king's castle, if you remember. And she's calling out to the shepherd. Now she has this incense around her and she is remembering back to when God was their king rather than a human king. You following me? Okay, the, uh, what's happening is the spices around her are evoking memories of her first marriage. Look what it says in Jeremiah chapter two, verse two. It says, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your spousals, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that wasn't sown. That was Sinai. That was Shavuot. That's when the espousal took place, when God gave them their commandments. God was engaged to Israel. So this is God also remembering when Israel was basically married to him. She's now forsaken him and she's gone to a human king that upset him. And now he's trying to draw her back to himself. Oh, here it is. Isaiah 5, 1 and 2. Now will I sing to my well-beloved, this is the bride, a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it. He gathered out the stones. He planted it with the choice vine. He built the tower in the midst. That's a tower to watch for the enemy coming, like foxes and the like. And he also made a wine press and he looked at it would bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. You ought to read the rest of the story in Isaiah 5. I don't have time to go over it, but I want to bring out the point that in the verse where she has the incense, it's evoking memory going back to God as her king. And now this is showing you that. And now watch what happens. Now the shepherd is speaking and look what he says to her. You are beautiful, my love. This is how you know he's talking. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are as what? Doves. And when we think of a dove, we think of something, we think of the Holy Spirit. Okay, you think of something calm and peaceful. Notice he didn't say your eyes are like the eyes of a hawk. Okay, what's the difference? A hawk is unclean because it's a predator. A dove is clean because it's not a predator. All right. Now, where is he looking? At her eyes. Every woman wants the guy to look in her eyes, okay? But where is she looking? She goes, hey, yeah, you're beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful, but look, our bed is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are of fur. She's not consumed with him looking in his eyes. She's looking at all the blessings she gets by going into this marriage. I'm sc- Look, score me. Look what I get. I'm going to marry him. It's our rafters. I mean, He's looking in her eyes, trying to, while she's going like this. Wow, look at that, look at that. Score! So her heart isn't with the shepherd yet. That's my point. This whole story in the Song of Songs is the maturity of the bride. 
He's always been consumed with her. She's always been consumed with what she gets out of the relationship. Okay. Now, the Shulamite continues. And this is where there's wrong translations in the King James. I'll go over it later, but this is the Old Testament that Danny, I'll be working on this next year. In the King James, it says, I am the Rose of Sharon, which is wrong. It's I am a Rose of Sharon, a Lily of the Valleys. So here she's saying, look, I'm one of these roses among all the roses. I am one of these lilies among all the lilies. Okay, the Rose of Sharon is the Messiah. Okay, a Rose of Sharon is part of the flock. Now, <clears throat> let me show you, and I will prove that. Look at Hosea chapter 14. It says, O Israel, return to the Lord your God. And that's what the shepherd's trying to get her to do in this story. You have stumbled because of your iniquity. I will heal your backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away. I will be like the dew to Israel, he shall grow like the lily. Well, guess what? Israel is compared to lilies. That's what I wanted you to see. And when it says the dew, it is referring to the resurrection of the dead. And I will prove that to you here with the scriptures in just a little bit. So basically, what he's saying, I'm the one who's going to raise Israel from the dead, and he's going to grow like the lily. Now, look at what he says in the next verse. He says, as the lily is among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. So here's the daughters of Jerusalem, and the shepherd compares them to thorns, but Jerusalem as a lily among the thorns. So the shepherd doesn't care about the daughters of Jerusalem. He cares about Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, uh, when she was born, when Jerusalem first came into existence, of course, it wasn't Jerusalem. She was surrounded by Canaanite nations. Now look at Psalm 137, verse 5 and 6. It says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I don't remember you, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. So the shepherd loves Jerusalem. Solomon loves the daughters of Jerusalem. Okay, so now we find she is talking about him. And she says about him as an apple tree among the trees of the forest. So is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat under his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Well, look at Psalm 91.1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 34.8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who trusts in him. Psalm 119.103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So he is the apple tree and he bears fruit and were to bear fruit. If you remember uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talks about the fruit of the spirit. But look at Hosea 14, 8 and 9. Ephraim's going to say, what have I to do anymore with idols? They're beginning to repent. And it says, I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress, cypress tree. And then God tells Israel, your fruit is found where? In me. That's where the fruit is. Let them understand these things. Who is prudent? Let them know them. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the transgressors stumble in them. Isn't that amazing? The very path that the righteous walk, the wicked stumble over. It's the same path. And the same thing with the law. People stumble over the law and others walk in the law. The problem isn't the law. The problem is your walk. Okay, so now the Shulamite continues and look what she says. He brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me was love. And then she says, sustain me with flagons 
Comfort me with apples. I am sick of love. Okay, well, guess what? She just said the shepherd brought me to his banqueting house, which means she's now left Solomon. She's not with the king. She's now with the shepherd. Okay, so here's the, a flagon of wine. The problem is she drinks too much. <laughs> Look at Hosea 3, 1 through 5. Then said the Lord to me, remember he's telling Hosea to go marry a harlot. And Jerusalem was considered a harlot. And look what this says. Go love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods. And what else do they do? They love the flagons of wine. That's their problem. So watch this. Hosea says, I bought her, his wife. He buys her for 15 pieces of silver. An omer of barley, a half omer of barley. And I said then to her, you're going to live with me for many days and you're not going to play the harlot and you will not be for anyone else. And so I will not be for anyone else either. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, an ephod, teraphim. That's what happened in the last 2,000 years, guys. This prophecy was fulfilled for the last 2,000 years. This is talking about today. And then it says, afterward, the children of Israel are going to repent or return and they're going to seek the Lord their God, David their king, and they're going to fear the Lord and his goodness in the last days. Here it is. This is exactly talking about where we're at right now and about the song. The Song of Songs is a prophecy about today. And they're going to return back to God as their shepherd and as their king. They're not going to want a human king. Look at the problems they have right now with a human king, so to speak. But do you know what's amazing about this? How much did he buy her for? 15 shekels. Okay, here you have a, a big ox. Listen to Exodus 21, 32. If an ox gores a slave, a male or female slave, he has to give to their master 30 shekels of silver and the ox will be stoned. So what we see here, a slave was worth 30 shekels but the bribe was only worth 15 shekels. That shows you how much her value had dropped. Okay, now here's the next most important verse. And the reason is it's a wrong translation in the King James again. In chapter two, verse six, it says, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. Who's speaking? She is, because she says, his left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. So who's laying down? Okay, let me help you. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand is embracing me. She is the one that is laying down. Then, as a matter of fact, listen to Psalm 121.4. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. How do you know God is the shepherd, the chief shepherd? He never slumbers or sleep. So it can't be him sleeping. And look at the next verse, Song of Songs, chapter two, verse seven. He says, I have adjured you, daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, stir not up nor awake love, my love, until she please. And every English King James Bible, it says he please, as if he's the one sleeping. It's not he please, it's she please. Now the Young's literal translation has it right. So some translations do say she, but King James is wrong and it says he. So who is going to sleep? The bride, the church. That's who constantly falls asleep all throughout history. Today, the sleeping church is known as the woke church. Just like Balaam who claims, I see, the one who sees, and he didn't see the angel, but the dumb donkey did. 
Now, here's the problem with wokeness. Here you have people that are pro Hamas and Hamas will kill them in a heartbeat. These people like them promoting Hamas is like chickens promoting Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But the problem, like I said, is the bride is fast asleep and she wants to sleep a little longer. So that ends the service. And then next week, we're going to begin chapter two, where the shepherd calls her and she falls asleep again. Let's dance.